The Omicron variant has caused an outright panic at the highest levels of our government. The Biden administration is now preparing to implement a new raft of measures to bring this strain of COVID-19 under control before we even really know very much about it. The panicked reaction is a far cry from the confident candidate who vowed to shut down the virus during the 2020 campaign. We'll get into how Biden has failed the country in tonight's Hold the Line. What I would say is I'm going to shut down the virus, not the country. I'm not going to shut down the country. I'm going to shut down the virus. I'm going to shut down the virus. I'm going to shut down the virus. I'll shut down the virus, not the economy. I'm going to shut down the virus. Once we shut down the virus, I'm going to shut down the virus. I'm going to shut down the virus. I'm not going to shut down the country, but I'm going to shut down the virus. Such a sub-mediocrity. It's amazing. Welcome to Hold the Line, I'm Buck Sexton. You get a sense of it there. Joe Biden telling everybody, oh, he's going to shut it all down. He's gonna shut down that virus. Not the economy, but what's that looking like these days? How's that promise to the American people working out? Well, just by way of looking at the recent numbers, COVID is surging across the northern uh, part of the United States. We have a record high hospitalizations all time all-time record high hospitalizations in Michigan. You have a record caseload and hospitalization in the state of Vermont, which is among the most, if not the most, heavily vaccinated states in the entire country. <clears throat> New York is also surging with COVID cases right now. And there are a lot of people going to the hospital too. So what the heck is going on? Whatever happened to the vaccine at 50, 60% would create some herd immunity for us. Well, obviously that's not happening anytime soon. Today, when asked if the U.S. can shut down the virus, here's what West Wing propaganda czar Saki had to say about it. The president, and you'll hear him speak to this today, continues to believe that uh, if we build on uh, the bold steps that we've taken to date, if we continue to make the vaccines more accessible, to increase testing, increase masking, we can return uh, to a, a, more, a version of normal in this country. That's what everybody wants and everybody would like to see. A version of normal. How about just normal? How about focus protection for those at high risk, shots and boosters for those who want them and or need them because they are in that high risk category and then leave everybody else the heck alone to live their lives? Wouldn't that be what we do with, oh, I don't know, even a really bad flu season? Otherwise, what are we in for? Booster shots forever, a continuous cycle of vaccination? trying to catch up to the latest mutation of a COVID variant. Doesn't seem like something that's a viable long-term plan if you believe in keeping our national sanity. Here is Saki, though, once again, chief propaganda czar of the West Wing of the White House, showing that really the disdain here should always be for Republicans and Trump because, yeah, orange man bad or something. Currently, in Congress, as we're looking at uh, the government staying open, you have supporters of the former president, uh, supporters of the former president who withheld information uh, reportedly about testing positive and appeared apparently at a debate, also held events at the White House reportedly with military veterans and uh, military families reportedly. Many of you covered, so you could, you could confirm that, um, and did that without disclosing. And these supporters of, this, uh, of the former president are advocating uh, for shutting the federal government down. Because they don't want the vaccine mandates. And by the way, the federal government shutdown doesn't mean there wouldn't be a federal government. It doesn't mean that there'd be anarchy, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. No, it would be fine. It just would force the government to make some decisions about what it's willing to do and who it's willing to twist the arm of. And that's what they don't want to have happen here. And what do they really even know about Omicron right now? Well, here's Dr. Ashish Jha saying she, think, you know, she thinks there'll be high protection. What I'm pretty confident about, and again, not without, <laughs> without a lot of data, but just based on what we do know, is that if you have had a booster, you're going to have such high levels of antibodies that you probably will have a good amount of protection against Omicron. Pardon me, he thinks you'll have a good amount of protection against Omicron. So where does that leave us? What about those who are just vaccinated? Is that really not enough? And what are the benefits other than, of course, 
the protection that they think you'll have, but they're not entirely sure. They don't know how long it'll last. They don't know how good it will be. What are the other benefits the Americans have? Well, if you get a booster, for example, can you avoid mask wearing the most annoying and omnipresent mitigation measure of the entire pandemic? Can you finally say, look, I'm getting the shot for the third time now. Can I please stop wearing this stupid effing mask on my face that I then take off at various times? And all you have to do is get infected once and you've had COVID, right? So you get it once. Does it matter if you got it, you know, day one or day 20 of your masking extravaganza? Here's Fauci saying fully vaccinated Americans still need, even with a booster, to wear masks. When you are in a public congregate setting in which you do not know the status of the vaccination of the people involved, it is very prudent to wear a mask. And that's what I do. When you're eating and when you're drinking, take the mask down. But to the, to the extent possible, keep it on when you're in an indoor congregate setting. To the extent possible, keep it on. That's really scientific, Fauci. Oh my gosh, I, I took too long eating my, you know, my cheese souffle. I might have COVID now because I didn't mask up fast enough. This is idiocy. But it's just the constant anxiety that surrounds a policy that, let's be honest, has failed. They failed, the public health establishment. They told us that we were going to be in a much better place than we are. They told us that if we follow their different guidance, their mitigation, their rules, that we'd shut down the virus. That was the promise Joe Biden made. Is the virus shut down? You have 86%, this is what Joe Biden said today, 86% of seniors vaccinated in America. So shouldn't we be at a place where everything's fine? Well, clearly, the vaccines don't protect as well as they told us they would. About 25% of the people in the hospital at any given time in places going through a surge are fully vaccinated. So it's not like this is a vaccine that has the bulletproof level of protection that we were told six months ago. And even beyond that, just look at the numbers. How do they explain what's going on right now? You've had a massive vaccination campaign, over 200 million Americans vaccinated. Uh, probably more like 250 at this point, maybe even closer to 275. And so you have that many people that have gotten the shot. How is it that you have states like Michigan that are setting all-time hospitalization record? It's all on the unvaccinated? Really? Well, everybody was unvaccinated this time last year. So why? Oh, because the Delta variant is so much worse. Well, now the Omicron variant, variant may be even worse than that. This is failure, folks. This is what failure looks like. They won't say it, but it's true. And Steve, uh, Peter Ducey, rather, over at Fox News, asked Jen Psaki about Biden's comment at the second presidential debate in 2020 that anyone who had over 220,000 people die as president shouldn't be president, right? So doesn't that mean with Joe Biden having over 300,000 people die on his watch, more than died on Trump's watch with no vaccine, doesn't that mean that Biden has failed? Watch. A lot of talk about the first Trump-Biden debate today, but at the second one in 2020, when roughly 220,000 Americans had already died of COVID, Joe Biden said about Trump, anyone who is responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president of the United States of America. Is that still the standard now that more Americans have died under President Biden than President Trump? Well, I think the fundamental question here is what are you doing to save lives and protect people? And the former president was suggesting people inject bleach. He apparently, reportedly, didn't even share with people he was going to interact with that he had tested positive for COVID himself. He continued to provide a forum for misinformation, which probably led to people not getting, uh, not taking steps forward to get to protect themselves, to wear a mask, to eventually get vaccinated. This president has made the vaccine widely available. He's relied on the health, uh, the advice of his health and medical experts, and he is trying to be a part of solving this crisis, getting the pandemic under control. And I think there's a pretty stark difference between their approaches. Yeah, except he failed by his own metrics. It's just reality. All right, coming up, we'll be joined by Reason Magazine's Robbie Suave about a surprise study showing the negative effects of lockdowns, masks, and social distancing on young Americans. But I want to talk to you about my digital money. The crypto market is hot right now. It seems like everybody wants to get on the action. But there's so many currencies to choose from, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any of the dozens of digital tokens out there these days. It's not easy to get started. That's where my digital money comes in. It's an easy to use, self-trading crypto IRA platform with concierge level customer service. Look, 
they can actually answer the phone and they will. And they'll an answer all your questions. When it comes to your money, you deserve a team of dedicated professionals who have your back and speak to you honestly. That's what you'll get with My Digital Money. Go to MyDigitalMoney.com. Again, that's MyDigitalMoney.com. And we'll be right back with more Hold the Line. For going on two years now, and despite all evidence to the contrary, health bureaucrats in the U.S. and around the world have insisted that masks, social distancing, and lockdowns are effective methods of controlling the spread of COVID-19. Just stay at home, wear the damn mask, stay six feet apart. Can't hurt, right? Well, apparently, they were wrong. According to a new study from Brown University, pandemic restrictions may actually be harming infants' cognitive developments. The study reveals, quote, children born during the pandemic have significantly reduced verbal, motor, and overall cognitive performance compared to children born pre-pandemic. Results highlight that even in the absence of direct SARS-CoV-2 infection and illness, the environmental changes associated with the virus is significant and negatively affecting infant and child development. Here with me to discuss this is senior editor at Reason Magazine. It's going to be very reasonable now. Robbie Suave. Good to see you, Robbie. Thanks for having me. Tell us what this article, what's, what's the big takeaway? What's the so what here? Yeah, I'm surprised it's getting not getting more attention. Uh, and, and we have to be very you know cautious. These are tentative results, hasn't been peer reviewed yet. But the researchers from Brown University found that, so we're looking at very young children. We're actually looking at children born during the pandemic. So we're really looking at babies, frankly. Um, but their cognitive scores on you know fine motor skills, um, uh, listening skills, other things like that, they're testing much lower, uh, about 23 percentage points lower than, you know, babies if, you, if between three and th three months and three years, if you tested them back in 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, they would have scored much higher. And, and, the, and the, the researchers think that's the pandemic mitigation efforts, not the, not the disease itself. Again, tentative results, you know, don't, don't go, aha, we know for sure, you know, we're murdering all our children because of this. But it's something to be aware of, given that we don't have any evidence, mass and, and school shutdowns and all the things we're doing to protect kids. That doesn't help them at all because they're at very, very low risk of COVID. So if the mitigation efforts aren't doing them any good and might be doing them harm, probably means we shouldn't be doing them. <laughs> Speaking of which, Robbie, there's a New York Magazine article that shows how much more at risk the elderly are than children. Hardly any American has a clear view of just how dramatic these differentials are. All else being equal, an unvaccinated 66-year-old is about 30 times more likely to die given a confirmed case than an unvaccinated 36-year-old. And someone over 85 is over 10 thousand times more at risk of dying than a child under 10 when it comes to COVID. I mean, this is a disease that is very dangerous for the elderly and not very dangerous for everybody else. I mean, what, what else, what more do we need in the data to be able to say that without people jumping all over us? I mean, it, it seems pretty obvious at this point. Yeah, the under 18 crowd have virtually no serious, severe health outcomes. I, there, there have been obviously children who've died uh, of COVID, but the overwhelming majority of them had some, you know, pre-existing very serious health condition. If you fall into that category, you probably should feel free to take extra precautions. But for the vast majority of kids, they don't have anything to fear from COVID. And yet kids are subject to the most, currently the most draconian uh, restrictions of all. The policies for school children are stricter then the policies for the elderly who are even who even if vaccinated are at much greater risk. Kids in New York and DC, I live in DC, they eat lunch outside during during school in the in the now currently freezing cold. They have to wear masks all day. They have to play sports in masks. Come on, like this is how ridiculous. This is completely ridiculous. On camp, the college campus rules are the craziest of all. The, you know, these these people aren't supposed to gather in groups of like more than two. You're supposed to eat lunch quietly in your dorm room. I mean, like these policies are insane. And this and these people, th this age cohort is at less risk of COVID than anyone else. I mean, speaking it makes of no sense. The, the policies when it comes to COVID, uh, Carol Markowitz uh, over the New York Post 
who's really been fighting the fight on this issue on behalf of kids. She's a mom. She's got her kids in public school here in New York City. She said it's 30, this was on Twitter, it's 37 degrees in New York City today. This was uh, back in late November. And kids at public schools around the city are still eating lunch, sitting on the ground outside. Grownups who enact these policies should try it. I think she's right, Robbie. Yeah. There, there was a picture of Randy Weingarten, the teachers union leader, who has been among the most important forces for most critical forces for keeping kids out of schools for as long as possible, which I think was terrible. She was at some <laughs> seminar, some conference, and, you know, she's she's not wearing her mask. And they somebody called her out on Twitter, even though she's indoors. And she said, yeah, I mean, I, I was intending to wear a mask, but people were having trouble understanding me. So I, I took it off. Okay. Yeah, Do, I, I wonder if I wonder if students and their teachers ha ever have trouble understanding each other and if we're inhibiting their learning if that could maybe be a possibility i don't know just you know I, just just theorizing i mean the amount of frustration and anxiety that people have unnecessarily particularly young people have been put through over covid is something that is uh, honestly a a stain on the public health establishment you know robbie i just I, you're, you're a libertarian you're a guy that's about individual freedom and liberty i, I gotta tell you it's amazing to me that all you have to do is look at Anthony Fauci, who has never once, from what I have seen, I've never, and I've seen this guy, I've seen him on TV more than any other human being on the planet in the last year. I mean, he's <laughs> on as a guest, as someone whose job is not actually television. He's a more frequent television appearance uh, person than anyone else out there. I've never heard him say about anything, whether it's double masking alone outside, or you know, children in schools, masking up kids, social distancing requirements that are three feet, six feet, 10 feet, who knows, drawing circle. He's never said, maybe that's a little bit excessive. Maybe we've gone too far there, folks. Calm down a little bit. I think we'll be okay. We don't need to do that. I think that's noteworthy. We have surrendered. We've given total control of our lives. Our government is being run by people who are sociopathically and, and like in a, in a like their development develop their socially disabled sort of way they are sociopathically antisocial anti human freedom and human flourishing their level of risk aversion is is beyond anything most normal human be, human beings consider wise and they are the ones who get to make all the decisions for us at the federal government level in cities in blue cities where Democrats have control, where the people who are who are loyal to Fauci and the CDC and the FDA are in control, they they will never and and also they they've just amassed this great amount of power. This the the federal science public health bureaucracy has taken power and they're never going to give that up. And if we're waiting for them to say it's okay, it's okay now, mission accomplished, we're done will never, that moment will never, never come, ever, right? ever yeah. come. A thousand and when we years do finally, from now, if, if we'll we ever rest power, days. yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Robbie, didn't mean to interrupt you. You're, everything you're saying, I couldn't agree more with. I just want to say, though, whenever we do finally wake up as Americans, and I hope it happens in the next year or so, it might not be for more than that. I really do worry about it. Um, then they'll say, well, we were just doing it for your own good. Right. Like they're the good guys, even if we have to stop them from ruining America. That's the way it'll be. Yeah. You know, and the TSA official who forces me to take off my belt and my shoes and, you know, rifles through my suitcase every time I get on a plane. He's telling me it's, it's for my own safety, too. Yeah. But we know that the lie. We know it doesn't contribute yes. to our safety whatsoever. We know wrestling masks onto two year olds does not contribute to their health and well-being at all. And in, in fact, it probably harms it, maybe in a, hopefully just in a small and temporary way that they will then overcome, but maybe in a larger way, we don't know. We're doing this experiment for absolutely no reason because it has no legitimate purpose. Robbie Suave, speaking sense, reason even. Good to see you, man. Thank you. As the White House prepares to implement new public health measures, there's one group of people who won't be subject to the new rules, illegal migrants. When we come back, we'll talk to former Navy SEAL and candidate for Congress in Texas, Morgan Luttrell, about the administration's hypocrisy at the southern border. First, I want to talk to you about protecting your online data. Big tech's taking advantage of us. They're mining our data, remining it, selling it. Guess what? We don't benefit from it at all. Do you really think your emails, texts, and messages are private and safe from government hackers and two-faced profit-hungry corporations? Think again. This is where Secure comes in. Secure's email platform is 100% private. It's Swiss hosted. They use their own servers in Switzerland and have no ties to American big tech companies. With Secure, there is no data mining whatsoever. It's completely private. This is what makes Secure different from every other email and messaging provider out there. 
Secure is the best email platform in the world when it comes to security and privacy. It's unmatched. Look, there's a reason Secure built their company the way they did. We need to make a stand and take back our privacy from the big tech monopolies. With my discount code BUCK, Secure will only cost you $750 a month for full access. That's nothing. Go to secure.com today. Create your secure email address and account. Use promo code BUCK for 25% off a whole year. That's secure.com, S-E-K-U-R.com, promo code BUCK. We'll be right back with Morgan Luttrell. Has you advised the president about the possibility of new testing requirements for people coming into this country? Does that include everybody? The answer is yes, because you know that the new, uh, uh, the new uh, uh, regulation, if you want to call it that, is that anybody and everybody who's coming into the country needs to get a test within 24 hours of getting on the plane to come here. But well, what about people who don't take a plane and just these border crossers coming in in huge numbers? You know, but that's, that's a different issue. Oh, that, that's a different issue. Of course, right? Dr. Anthony Fauci getting called out on the Biden administration's hypocrisy over the free-for-all at our southern border. This comes as Biden will announce a stricter COVID policy on people traveling legally in the United States. So why do illegal migrants seemingly have more freedoms than actual citizens when it comes to the Fauci madness? Morgan Luttrell, former Navy SEAL and Texas congressional candidate, joins me now to make some sense of all the madness. Morgan, good to see you. Hey, it's good. Thanks for having me on the show, Bob. I mean, just tell me this, man. What's your thought as a, as a Texan, uh, as an American and a patriot, when you hear really the COVID czar, I mean, this guy gets to make policy in a way that no one should ever be able to inside the federal bureaucracy who's unelected, but when he's just like, yeah, you know, different rules for the illegal migrants at the border under Biden. Why? I don't know. I, I honestly, I, I can't get my head around that. If that would have been, if it were in the Trump administration in this same seat, this has been happening, that, that we, they would be crucifying us. And I, I don't understand how he can honestly deflect the press, that question and say, yeah, we're gonna have to, we'll have to test every single person coming into the country. Oh, except by the way, not the ones that are coming across illegally. And we're here where I live. This is where they're landing. When they come across the border, they're not staying there. They're moving up into District 8 where I live and where I'm running for Congress. And it's, it's overwhelming. It's amazing. Tell me what it's like. I mean, here's, here's right now the, the latest numbers we could pull, uh, Morgan, at the southwest border. Uh, we have 164,000 encounters in October of 2021. 71,000 October of 2020. It's up 128% from last year. What do you attribute that to? And what does it mean for folks who live in places like Texas where the inflow is happening? Uh, I contribute that to this administration not fulfilling their fiduciary responsibilities to protect our borders. I mean, it's in the Constitution, Article 4, Section 4, that they're supposed to do that. And they're just not. And I don't, and what the, and they, they can't appreciate the weight that our state feels when you have that amount of influx of, of immigrants coming across illegally into our into our state we don't we can't hardly house the ones that are doing it correctly and properly much less all of them coming in and just scuttling the infrastructure we can't, it's, it's unsustainable and everything that's coming across with that not besides just the illegal immigration the drugs the trafficking the what the illegal web the cartel is just overwhelming us out here mayorkas who is the dhs chief morgan uh, when asked about this, and he's the one who's directly overseeing the policies at the border, right? So Fauci basically says, oh, well, it's the federal government and, you know, the other parts of the government. So not my problem. I might make everybody who comes here legally because of my advisory role, which is crazy, uh, have to go through quarantine procedure or have to go through testing. But illegals get a different, a different setup. That's a DHS thing, he'll say. Okay, well, here's Secretary Mayorkas on why there's no vaccine mandate for illegal immigrants. Watch this. Now, we've got a president who's implementing a national mandate for vaccines for any employers over 100 employees and all federal employees. Why shouldn't we mandate that somebody who comes across the border illegally shouldn't be vaccinated or that's a reason for expulsion under well, Title 42 or any other law? Uh, um, Senator, um, uh, the analysis for um, uh, migrants encountered at the border is quite different uh, than for uh, the federal workforce that leads by example. Yeah, what do you think about that? I'm trying not to think about it at all. That's just an asinine statement. I think because he he can, he has latitude to say that because the vice president who's in charge of border security does nothing. 
And if you're if you're not going to hold your leadership accountable above you, why why would you? And they know he knows that he can he can he can articulate any point he wants and will not be held accountable because Biden doesn't care and Vice President Harris doesn't care. Here's a September audit from the official DHS Office of the Inspector General, uh, Morgan. It reads. U.S. Customs and Border Protection does not conduct COVID-19 testing for migrants who enter CBP custody and is not required to do so. Instead, CBP relies on local public health systems to test symptomatic individuals. According to CBP, as a frontline law enforcement agency, it does not have necessary resources to conduct such testing. So we have effectively an open border in the, in the sense of people entering illegally in probably the highest numbers ever for this past year, right? I mean, that's, we're on track for that already. It'll be close to 2 million people, which is mind-blowing. And oh, by the way, a large percentage of them have come across the border, or a large percentage of people relative to, you know, what you would uh, want because it's zero. You want no people coming across your border illegally and with COVID uh, actually have COVID. So why isn't this a bigger issue for the Biden administration? Another great question, but one that they won't answer. They're going to look up, and this is going to be, it'll be, it's already unsustainable, but it'll be, it's a cancer. And once that cancer takes root and becomes systemic, it'll, it'll scuttle us down here and kill us in a way that we can't rebound, we can't rebound from that. I, improper yeah, correlated, directly correlated to this problem. Uh, by the way, some people see it the way we do, who actually have some power to do something in their states, at least. Uh, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, here he is on the mandates we're talking about. We have the, the lowest COVID rate in the country, and so, but a lot of those places that have the high infections, they have mandates and they have passports and they have all these things. We need to get real here and we should not be imposing any type of mandates uh, or restrictions on the American people, especially when you don't do that for people that are coming into the country illegally. Yeah. That seems much more sensible, you. doesn't it? I had an opportunity to meet him. Was it? Thank you. For, thank you for having the chest to stand up and say that. Thank yeah. you. Someone who sees reality here, Morgan. Before we let you get back to it, you're running for Congress in a great state, Texas. Tell us a bit about it. Yes, sir. I'm uh, running for Congress in District Eight. Our Kevin Brady is our our incumbent. He's retiring after 25 years, and I I grew up here. I'm a hometown boy, and. Uh, after serving in the military and serving under Trump administration for Secretary of Perry, Department of Energy, my wife and family and I, we made the decision that it would be necessary to, to run for this seat and just, again, support and defend the Constitution of the United States and our conservative Christian values that we hold so dear here. Morgan, best of luck to you. Thank you for your service and thank you for embarking on, the, on this next uh, effort to serve your country. Good luck to you. We'll talk to you soon. Have a, have a blessed day. There were more hearings on Capitol Hill this week on the influence of big tech on public debate. Facebook employee Kara Frederick, who offered testimony yesterday, joins us next to tell us what went down. Right now, I want to tell you one more time about my friends at My Digital Money. Crypto is heating up, Bitcoin, Ethereum, a lot of digital tokens out there. How do you get started? That's where My Digital Money comes in. It's an easy to use, self trading crypto IRA platform with incredible customer service. They'll actually answer your phone call and help you get started. Your comfort and security is their absolute top priority. Look, if you want someone that has your back and speaks to you honestly and answers that phone when you need them, that's what you get with My Digital Money. Go to MyDigitalMoney.com to begin your crypto investment journey. MyDigitalMoney.com. Holding big tech accountable should result in less censorship, not more. In fact, the First Amendment should be the standard from which all Section 230 reforms flow. Despite what the new Twitter CEO might think, American lawmakers have a duty to protect and defend the rights given to us by God and enshrined in our Constitution by the founders. Rights that specific tech companies, in conjunction with the government, are actively and deliberately eroding. Former Facebook employee Kara Frederick testified before Congress yesterday. Alongside Facebook whistleblower Francis Hogan, the pair torched big tech and called out the left's bogus solutions that will only censor more Americans and leave tech giants off the hook. Kara Frederick, who's also a research fellow for technology policy at the Heritage Foundation, joins me now to discuss big tech's gross abuse of power and the crucial steps Congress needs to take, uh, needs to take rather, to hold them accountable. Kara, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. 
All right, so conservatives talk a lot about this, and I feel like we know something's wrong because people like me get suspended and kicked off and all that stuff from social media, sometimes for saying things that are just objectively true. So we got problems here. How do we fix it? That is a good question and one that Congress has been grappling with thus far for a pretty long time. I mean, there have been solutions that have been proposed from antitrust to reform of Section 230. That was a subject of yesterday's hearing that I testified in. Uh, but in my mind, Section 230 reform, pretty critical. We can go over that in a little more detail. But the biggest takeaway, I think, is that Section 230 reform is not going to do it. It's not the silver bullet. It's not a panacea. We have to look outside of Washington, D.C. in order for conservatives to have their culture of free speech back, uh, to have rights to freedom of expression uh, be given back to them. Because the concentrations of power that these big tech companies abuse, they redound not to the benefit of conservatives but to the opposite. So look at grassroots movements, civil society. I really like the anti-critical race theory model that's galvanized parents. You know, we know that Instagram, Facebook knows that Instagram, which they own, is toxic to teen girls. Let's get parents excited about this. Let's get the states to pass laws about this. Let's get founders to build new things that can contend, hopefully, with some of these companies. The time to start is now. It's an uphill battle, but I think we have to look at Section 230 reform and then look out outside of D.C. as well. Okay, so you've mentioned Section 230. It's come up before. During the Trump administration, there was a lot of talk toward the end about doing something about Section 230. For the folks at home, what does it basically, what does Section 230 essentially mean right now, and how would you like to see it change so that there's greater freedom of speech and less overt politicization in the way the big tech companies operate? Yeah, so this is part of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. Some people in the tech community call this Section 230 the 26 words that created the internet. And what it effectively does is shield these tech companies from immunity for taking things down in good faith or for the comments that are on the, their platform. So it says that these tech companies are platforms, they're not publishers of information. So if somebody spews uh, gross smut in the comment sections, then uh, ostensibly Facebook would not be responsible for that. Or if they conduct illegal activity, et cetera, et cetera, uh, these big tech platforms would be considered just that, platforms, not publishers. Now, what we've seen, and these are Clarence Thomas words, is there's been an expansion, a sweeping immunity as interpreted by the courts of Section 230 that's really extended these immunities that tech companies have. So it's allowing them right now, in my opinion, to effectively act as publishers. You look at those labels on tweets, you look at the labels on Instagram and whatnot, that's editorializing from what I see. That's a company saying what you can say or what you can't say. Uh, that, I believe, goes beyond the, the, the fact that they have immunity from these things. So what I think needs to change is liability protections should be removed from these companies when they censor based on political views. Also, increase transparency. So tech companies, they'll offer up some quarterly reports on how they engage with law enforcement, how they enforce certain community standards. But let's see what they're actually doing when it comes to these content moderation practices, aka conservative censorship in a lot of instances. And uh, let's let's open up that, um, uh, that aperture and let's see what's actually happening. And then oh. give people their voices back, right? Have prompt and meaningful recourse when their rights have been violated on these platforms. I definitely could use my voice back right now, so I, <laughs> I hear you on that. Um, there's a lot of focus on the new Twitter CEO right now and the new Twitter privacy policy that's out there. As part of our ongoing efforts to build tools with privacy and secu at security at the core, this is from Twitter, we're updating our existing private information policy Expanding its scope to include private media. There are growing concerns about the misuse of media and information that's not available elsewhere as a tool to harass, intimidate, reveal the identities of individuals. Sharing personal media, images, videos, et cetera, et cetera, can have, well, let's just say, can create problems. I mean, there's a whole lot more of how they say it there. What does that actually mean? 
<laughs> That's a really good question. I don't think most people actually know what that means. And I know that Twitter tried to break out some of these definitions and to clarify, but let's be honest, they made a vague policy as they always do so that when they inconsistently enforce them, they can hide behind these terms of service, these community standards, et cetera. I believe that tech companies intentionally make their policies vague so they can change them on the fly. At Facebook, we called it building an airplane in mid-flight. You know, we were we were trying to figure out the answers to problems as they were arising. Uh, lots of things on the platform, so lots of things to contend with. But the companies hide behind these vague policies, and they've been doing it for so long. So something like this, this privacy policy, and I'm not the first person to say this, but I don't know if you know the journalist Andy No, who exposed a lot of the uh, crimes that Antifa was committing on the West Coast. He wouldn't have been allowed to post those videos under this Twitter privacy policy. So I think they have some rethinking to do, and they need to tighten up those definitions and those policies if they want to have any semblance of treating people even-handedly on these platforms. Kara, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for having me, Buck. This great CNN anchor Chris Cuomo is speaking out on his suspension from TV. We'll have that audio for you in quick hits. But first, I want to talk to you about a potential investment opportunity. You ever want to invest in real estate, but you knew you didn't have the time to do it on your own and you didn't want to make rookie mistakes? I felt that way until about a year ago. I always loved the idea of real estate investment, but I didn't want to get involved in something without knowing how I was going to get through the process. That's when I met my friends at Done For You Real Estate. They took all the guesswork out of it for me. They found me an awesome property, rented it out for me right away. They managed the tenant for me. And now I get a check every month like clockwork. Don't wait another second to see if my buddies at Done For You Real Estate can do for you what they did for me. Visit doneforyoubuck.com to see how it works. Every step of the process, picking the city, the house, getting the loan set up, getting a tenant in place, and a management company to handle the whole thing for you. Go to doneforyoubuck.com to see what my friends can do for you. Again, that's doneforyoubuck.com to begin your real estate investment journey. Quick hits coming up next. Disgraced cable news anchor Chris Cuomo addresses his suspension from CNN and Alec Baldwin claims he didn't pull the trigger. Those stories coming up in tonight's Quick Hits. Let's get to it. Uh, first off, I have to say, I don't think that Chris Cuomo is going to be uh, terminated from CNN. I don't think that he's done in broadcasting because he's a lib. And libs get to live by a very different set of rules, certainly a different set than they want to enforce upon their conservative counterparts who are never given the benefit of the doubt, given no quarter, given no second chances. If you're a lib, you get to continue on and fight another day, even if you go through a rough patch, you could say. And certainly Chris Cuomo, who has taken a very active role in trying to do everything he can to help his disgraced former governor of New York brother, Andrew Cuomo, out of hot water, uh, it's, it's a bad look for Chris Cuomo to be an anchor over at CNN, pretending to be unbiased and do what he did. Even beyond that, CNN should be ashamed of the way they built up Andrew Cuomo into some kind of a hero during the pandemic. They allowed Chris and Andrew, two brothers, to go on air and do some kind of comedy variety show when thousands and thousands of people across the country were dying of COVID, most notably for the governor of New York in his own state, including in part because of an order that Andrew Cuomo signed sending people with COVID back into nursing homes by executive order, an insane decision and just part of the tyrannical and stupid overreach of the Cuomo regime. Here is Chris Cuomo on his Sirius XM radio show addressing it. I've been suspended from CNN. Uh, do me a favor, cut the music. Thank you. Uh, you know this already. Uh, it hurts to even say it. Uh, it's embarrassing. But I understand it. And I understand why some people feel the way they do about what I did. I've apologized in the past. I mean it. It's the last thing I ever wanted to do was compromise any of my colleagues and do anything but help. I know they have a process that they think is important. I respect that process. So I'm not going to talk about this any more uh, than that. They're going to bring him back. Just like they brought back Tubin. The zoom in Tubin. I won't say more than that because we all know that could get me, you know, I mean, we all know what Jeffrey Tubin did, right? They brought him back, eh? no big deal. Um, and actually, the Tubin thing, you could argue, because it was an accident, although it was really gross. I mean, which, what's worse, Chris Cuomo 
intentionally lying and maneuvering behind the scenes to help his brother and use his perch at CNN to do so and his media connections to maybe even out or smear some of the attackers against the brother. It's bad stuff. More bad stuff. When we look at the situation on the set of the movie Rust, the aftermath of it all, when Alec Baldwin is now claiming that he didn't pull the trigger in the deadly shooting that claimed the life of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Listen to this. This is a preview of an interview on ABC News tomorrow. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. <laughs> well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. What did you think happened? How did a real bullet get on I, that I, set? I have no idea. Someone put a live bullet in a gun, a bullet that wasn't even supposed to be on the property. He didn't pull the trigger, so someone else did? Because someone pulled the trigger, because guns don't fire themselves. So I guess we're going to find out you know, tomorrow. I have a feeling it may be some, oh, we may never really know. I didn't pull. No one pulled the trigger. It was just a thing that happened. I don't know. I don't think so. CNBC's Jim Cramer is uh, supposed to be an entertaining finance guy, but he's kind of lost his mind. Here he is suggesting not only a nationwide vaccine mandate, meaning they're going to like force needles into your arms. He wants the United States military to run it and enforce it. Now we're engaged in a similar struggle with COVID and Eisenhower would be aghast. We have immunocompromised people who are incubators for every variant to come walking around lawfully unvaccinated. That's psychotic. We have companies that have tried hard to get people vaccinated now backing down. We have governors who want to be president by grandstanding on a foolish state's right issue, the right to get sick and get other people sick. So it's time to admit that we have to go to war against COVID. Require vaccination universally. Have the military run it. If you don't want to get vaccinated, you better be ready to prove your conscientious objector status in court. And even then, you need to help in the war effort by staying home until we finally beat this thing. Out of his mind. That's it for tonight's Hold the Line. The No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly is up next. Shields high.